we start a new month. And of course, in this month, we're talking about praying with impact. Speaking about the church's core value of prayer, the church states that prayer is the first of the Church of God of Prophecy's five core values. The church, according to the church, says that prayer touches everything, informs all activities, empowers all ministry and service, and permeates the work from beginning to end. We here at the Old Arbor Road Church are on a mission to increase in maturity, power, and authority through Christ for transformation. We acknowledge that this mission cannot be accomplished without prayer. Ian Bounds, one of the authorities, some would say, on prayer, says, Prayer is a capital stock in heaven by which Christ carries out his great work on the earth. The greatest life-transforming activities in the earth have been as a result of prayer. Prayer is therefore more than words spoken in the atmosphere. It is more than positive speaking. Prayer is divine access. Everybody say, prayer is divine access. The book of Acts gives an illustration of the power and working of the gospel when preached among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The opening sentences of Acts are just an expansion of uh, or an explanation of the closing words in the gospel. In this book, we have just a continuation of the history of the church after Christ's ascension. Luke, the author here, carries on the history in the same spirit in which he commenced it. It is a book of beginnings, a book of history, of the founding of the churches, the initial steps in the formation of the Christian society in the different places visited by the apostle. All through the narrative, we see the ever-present, all-controlling power of the ever-living Savior. In the text, we see him among the community, declaring his truth by the Spirit and through the instrumentality of the apostles. In this regard, the book is also a record of a cycle of representative events, one of which we will be reflecting on today. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And I encourage you when you come to church to bring your Bibles. I know we are modern and you have your phones, but I encourage you to bring your actual Bibles to church. I was listening to a sermon this morning and the preacher said he didn't want the congregation to use their phones because a text is going to come in and you're going to be tempted to move from the screen of the phone to go to the text. So bring your Bibles to church. My B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E, sing it one more time. The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. So bring your Bibles, take down your Bibles from where you hide it, and bring your Bibles to church. Amen? Phone and iPod and tablet is wonderful, but bring your Bibles to church. At least it would look like you're going to church. So let's read. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask arms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John 
about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Thank you, Lord, for your words today. Let your words fill our hearts. Let your word transform our minds. Let your word bring revelation, revelation of who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. From the passage, I want to identify a few reference points. One, prayerfulness. Write it down if you are taking notes. Prayerfulness. Prayerfulness describes the disposition of someone who does not only pray as an activity, but instead his or her life is characterized by a lifestyle of praying. You know, there are some persons who they will pray a long prayer, and you know my position when it comes to this long praying. And when they pray that long prayer, sometimes to impress people, that's it. There's no more reference to prayer for the rest of their day or the rest of the time. That long prayer is what they believe suffices. But I don't believe that's prayerfulness. Prayerfulness to me is to always have prayer at the center of your thought. So a prayerful person is someone who approaches everything he or she does with prayer. I don't mean long prayer kneeling down, but simply, Lord, help me. Lord, I'm about to do this thing. What do you think? Help me. Give me grace. It's that always and constant calling on the Lord to help us in our daily chores and daily activities of life. Rather than praying and putting it down like when you cook food and you put it down and then you don't go back to it until some other time. I don't know if that's a good analogy, but you can take it how you want. The text indicates to us the practice of prayer by the early church when it referenced the hour of prayer. The Jews had a habit of praying around about three times daily. The third, ninth, and sixth, the third, sixth, and ninth hours, which some people say would be 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 3 o'clock p.m. We see this as early as the book of Daniel 6. In Psalm, for instance, in Psalm 55, verses 16 and 17, the psalm is declared, But I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. So prayerfulness is that ability to stay with God throughout all different seasons, twists, and turns of your life. The early church ensured that it was always connected to the head through being prayerful. Prayerfulness opens up the space for the free flow of life from the head to the body. Because there is always a constant connection between the headship and the body of Christ, which is the church. So I'm encouraging a culture of prayerfulness. You will find that if you're a prayerful person, when you're about to take the wrong decision, because it doesn't fit into the model of prayerfulness, you will not find yourself taking that bad decision. So let us say, for instance, you are going to criticize the pastor. You are not going to pray and say, Lord, as I'm about to criticize Pastor Headlam. I don't think you're going to say that. So if you have a practice to pray, to engage with God in your thoughts and decisions, you're going to find that prayer becomes more 
a culture, a habit, than it just being an activity. Amen. The second point is powerfulness. Jesus told the disciples in Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Therefore, for the church of function, it must possess power. And power can only fill the church when the church actually prays. The only medium, the only channel for power in God's church is through prayer. Amen. We are, you are hearing me today through this sound system because it is plugged into power. If we are to unplug it, you perhaps would hear me, but not as clearly as you are hearing me now. The fans will stop working, and we are already hot. And so many things, the multimedia would go down, the lights would go off, and the whole situation would change because there is no, no power. If the church is going to have an impact on the world, the church must have power. We don't have money as the world has. So we cannot compete with the world monetarily. But the church has something that money cannot buy. The church has access to God. Access to power. And that the world cannot contest. The church must have power. You know when I'm preaching, you need to preach with me. Say amen. amen. The text tells us that this nameless man was at the temple's gate. Daily he would be left at the gate to solicit arms. You will know that it was while Peter and John were going to the temple at nine o'clock or thereabout that they confronted the man in his condition. Now, this is quite a contrast. And interestingly, this is a sermon I preached not so long ago. I did some fixing of it, so if you're taking notes, you will realize that. But interestingly, the, the, the power, the way the church sometimes view prayer and power is that for the church to exercise power, it must first find itself in three days of prayer and fasting. There are conditions that exist in the world that can't wait on your three days of prayer and fasting. Say amen if you believe me. It needs an immediate download of power to change that situation. Not three days from now. Amen, church. The church must be battle ready. The church must be what? Battle ready. The church must be solution ready. The church must be answer ready. The church must be ready for what is happening around not getting ready. Glory to God. And when you live prayerfully, we live in a place of readiness. Hallelujah. You don't have to wait on any backup when you live in a place of prayerfulness, any demon that arises will meet upon the power that exudes from you because you are prayerful and that means you are powerful. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and praise him. 
Hallelujah. The powerfulness in the text was borne out as the apostle responded to the man. They were men of power and that power filled life impacted this lame man at the temple's gates. It wasn't a shouting match because unfortunately Pentecostals have made power look like it is how loudly you shout. So we say the person is a powerful prayer because of how loudly the person shouts. We say the person is a good prayer person because how long the person prays. But I heard Minister Dean preaching this morning and he reminded us that James says that it is the effectual, fervent prayer of who? A righteous person that has great effects. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me, church? And I heard him say something he said, that means we must pray for ourselves. That means we must go down before God and say, Lord, here am I, help me. Because the, what do you call it, minister? The effectual, fervent prayer is not reserved for a special group of people. Everybody who knows the King of Glory can call out to Jesus. I feel like asking you right now, everybody, just to lift your hand and say, Jesus, help me. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, help me. Praise him, church. Praise him, church. That power-filled life of Peter and John affected this lame man. It changed his life. He was no longer the same. Because these prayerful men possess power. Oh, hallelujah. And the power that they possessed had an impact on this man who represented the community. And his life was changed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If there is anything that I am longing for, brothers and sisters, is to see God move in a tangible, manifest way among his people. Oh, I don't have many agreeers with that. Hallelujah. It is time our prayer moves from words to actions. It is time we see and experience the manifestation of God in the midst of his people. I wonder if I have anybody who believes me today. God still heals. God still delivers. God still sets free. God is still mighty. God still answers prayer. God still moves. Hallelujah. Help me pray and say, God, 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 move in our midst. I hear somebody say, we need a move. We need a move. We need a move. Hallelujah. You have heard me say it over and over. There are too many people, Minister Glossy, who are in church, ne never experienced a touch from God. Too many people in the church who have never felt the presence of God. 
church Sunday after Sunday, days after days, week after week, but never feel anything, never experience anything, singing on the choir, doing other things, but never experience anything. I am calling the church to a place of experience. Somebody need to preach with me and say, experience. Hallelujah. It's more than sitting in church and listening to the preacher. It's more than just coming to church. Somebody need to say, Lord, 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 touch me today. How are we going to heal the lame man if we ourselves are lame? How are we going to rescue if we ourselves are lost? How are we going to strengthen if we ourselves are weak? The church has not been called to a place of weakness. We are called to a place of strength. That's why the scripture said, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the whole armor of God that you will be what? Able to withstand in the evil days, hallelujah, and having done all to stand Stand. Glory to God. We need power. I can see you don't believe me, you know. I can see not many people believe me, sister. Johnny, we need power. We need power. Power is there. We need to plug in to the source of divine power. Uh, am I talking to the church? I look at us and some of us are becoming so weaky, weaky, feeble, tired. Because we are doing things by our own strength. If we do things by our own strength, we will be burned out. Are you hearing me, church? But when you find that you are doing things in your strength, it's time to plug into power. For it is not by might, not by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. The church needs power. Hmm. That's why we're so tired all the time and dreary all the time and weak all the time because we are in our own strength. I hear somebody say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Some of you, when I look at you on a Sunday morning, I have to close my eyes because you look like You look like God has abandoned you. I look this morning and I listen to the choir. No, let me not do the choir. I'm not criticizing, I was just referring to your song. But I was watching the congregation and we're singing atmosphere. We're singing atmosphere shift. Chains be broken. And see some of you here. Don't even believe that in this prophetic moment, God 
can change your situation and you have an ability to command the change by speaking to the atmosphere. You see, when you come to church and it's praise and worship time, we write the song and we give you. Most of you have it right, written. Not true. Talk to me. Not true. We put it up and not on one screen, two screen. If you can't see these two, you can turn around and read that one. It means church of God. You must open your mouths, sing the songs of Zion, sing from your belly, let your voices be heard in the sanctuary. Open your mouths and sing to the Lord. Open your mouths and worship God. Open your mouth and praise the Lord. What kind of church are we where people don't even want to sing? I don't know how I get into that, but I'm talking about power because you are not going to experience power by thinking about it. You can think about it all you want. But the man who was at the gate of the temple, Peter and John, did not just think that this man could be whole. They didn't think that he could be whole just simply th that and look at him and think. And I hear the new thing now is that, oh, I'm worshiping in my mind. Nonsense. Oh yes, you must worship in your mind, but you must worship and express your worship in praise and adoration to the one who you are worshiping in your mind. Am I talking to the church? We need some life in this place. We need the people who are Holy Ghost filled in the church to practice your Holy Ghost fill. I don't know if I said that right, but you understand what I mean. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you must have something about you. You can't be dry. Mm, Jesus. The only, the only reason why some people, why I know some people are filled with the Holy Spirit is because we see them write it somewhere. People who are filled with the Holy Spirit must have something different that when the people them who not feel yet look on you and look on us and say, but something different. But how is it that people say they are filled with the Holy Spirit and them can't even speak in tongues? I don't know what kind of church we're turning into. Everybody say power. Say power. We must experience the power of God in our lives. And that can only happen when the church prays. Raise your hands and praise him, everybody. The third point, and I'm ending soon, so don't get too worried, is purposefulness. So we talk about prayerfulness, powerfulness, purposefulness. Peter and John knew what they were about. They understood the mission that they were committed to and guided by the Holy Spirit. That Peter noticed the lame man is another evidence of spirit-led ministry. No doubt there were thousands of People near the temple, according to Acts 4.4. 4. And perhaps scores of beggars might have been there, lying, waiting at the gate, beautiful, to get alms from them. The giving of alms was something 
that was practiced, practiced in the Jewish faith. So beggars found it profitable to be near the temple since they, be they believed that the people going inside there would give them something. Peter and John said they didn't have any money. But they, what they had, they were going to give to the man. He needed salvation for his soul, healing for his body, and money could not provide any of that. Through the power of the name of Jesus, the beggar was completely healed, and he was so happy and excited that he acted like a child, leaping and praising God. Hallelujah. So what is the purpose? The man was lame, he was poor, he was without hope, and he was, and that was how his life was. That, my brothers and sisters, is how our life was before we came to Christ, and how it is for many even today. The man's response to the healing saw him forgetting his physical limitations. The what he was asking for money became no longer a request because he got something greater than money. He got his freedom. He got his deliverance. He got his healing. Somebody praise God. Somebody praise him one more time. What a difference when the church discerns what is needed from acting out of just what it experiences. The man needed more than money. He needed Christ. He needed what comes with Christ, the power of Christ. And he was delivered, praise God, somebody. This man who had no name, still had no name, because of what happened now, he was now the talk of the town. Everybody wanted him on their new station to tell him what happened. Hallelujah. To tell them what happened. Jesus healed him. Jesus delivered him. Jesus set him free. Jesus brought him deliverance. It is the same Jesus that I'm speaking about today in our midst. Lift your hands and praise him, brothers and sisters. Praise him one more time, brothers and sisters. Praise him with strength, brothers and sisters. Praise him one more time. He is still a God who hears and answers prayer. And whatever and wherever you are, God will hear you if you cry out to him. Somebody said, this poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and delivered him from all of his fears. He still hears and answers prayer. Stand with me, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. God still hears and answers prayer. He hears and answers prayer. Is there anybody in this place today who has a need for a prayer to be answered? Maybe a need in your body, a need in your family, a need in your finances. I remind you today that Jesus still hears and answers prayer. Hallelujah. Jesus hears. Jesus hears. Jesus hears and answers prayer. If we ask in faith, glory to God. 
Sing it out. Jesus hears. Jesus hears. And answers prayer. And answers prayer. Come on, church. Sing it. Sing it out. Jesus And answer prayers. If you need salvation, he's here today. Come to if we ask in faith. Christ can break every fetter. Where's the church? Christ can break. Every fetter, every fetter, if we ask in faith, hallelujah, Jesus hears, Jesus hears, and answers prayer, Jesus hears. And answer prayer if we ask in faith. Christ can break, Christ can break every fetter. Every fetter, every fetter. If we ask in faith, hallelujah. 